So, Peter, we're here at Tysaac's Dam, Abbeydale Industrial Hamlet. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the history of this site and, and what you've been doing in terms of managing the ecology. Well, historically, I mean, I was invited to come and work here as a grinder many years ago, in the, I think it was 1980, 85, 86. And then, as I was here for quite a few years and I'd shown interest as a fisherman, at the mill pond into creating a fishery, a sustainable fishery. And so it was in 1997 when I got that opportunity to introduce some fish to create this sustainable fishery. But it didn't last too long. It was, I think it was 2001 when the fish were removed for repairs to the dam. But that was a positive because... So that was a repair down here, wasn't that was it? A repair it was a, it was a leak here. in the dam was wall. Leak in yeah. The dam wall. Yeah. And at that time, you know, I, I was trying to create this fishery, so we had to start all over again. But to start all over again in a positive way meant that we could try and create uh, the reed beds and the requirements of not only the fish, the invertebrates, and all the mammals and everything else what came with it. And it was a wonderful opportunity. And as you see on some of the pictures I've shown you, the reed beds were actually full of, uh, of uh, the marginal reeds, Glyceria maxima. And we've got a few iris at top, but yeah, I mean, there's a mixture. So when the dam, when we actually, when the water came back in the dam and they repaired the leaks, there were lots of plants what grew on here. And we moved some of those out into the margins and we can still see a few of those up the dam now, some of the typha. Oh, at the typha top end, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so you can still see them still hanging on here. But what we've been getting over the years, now that went on for 10 years and it was amazing to see all the invertebrates, the dragonflies, damselflies, and even watervol come to the work what we'd, uh, what we'd done mm. after years, after all those years. And then it came again after 10 years, another leak, uh, some repairs to the, uh, to the uh, sluice gates, and they, they put on some modern sluice boards, so, uh, modern sluice boards, so all the work and effort, what we'd gone, what we'd done, sort of, of taking a back seat at the moment so what we're really looking for is sort of like some longevity with it some stability in the water levels and then we'll be able to create such a wonderful environment again because it is a problem with a, a mill pond that you do tend to get a boom bust situation in terms of water so you get a lot of water yeah, then you sometimes. haven't got enough yeah and also the other long-term problem with yeah. uh, mill ponds is obviously silting up and having to desilt. Yeah, that's another Cause thing. Because when you look at it today, yeah. Yeah. there's not a huge amount in terms of the invertebrates, no. in terms of the marginal vegetation, no, that's right. compared to say 10 years ago no. even, it seems to have It's gone, it's declined. depleted, it's declined. It's yeah. such a short time really. But I did do, I used to manage the water, the water coming off the river. And again, we have to take consideration about the amount of water you, what you're pulling off the river. And we could find a balance where it would help to run the water wheels and also maintain uh, a level which was suitable mm. for the plants and the fish and everything else. And uh, I used to go up there two or three times a year making sure it was cleaned out. You know, there's a valve up there, what you can turn, you can allow more in or turn it down if you're getting too much out. And it's been over these last probably, you know, what was it, since 2014, things have deteriorated. Mm. I don't go up the river anymore, there's a contractor comes in. But I've been helping them with sort of showing them the things I used to do to maintain a balance. And there's and obviously there's obviously fish in here because the heron fish. the heron has come yeah. back. It, yeah. it moved off when we walked up the yeah, pond. Yeah, there's quite. But it's come back. There's quite. And it's there now, yeah. and you can see it stalking. Yeah. It's fishing. Yeah. yeah, there's quite a lot of fish. We've put in native species of fish, and they're there, and they are really developing some of the fish. I caught a roach the other week, and it was over two pound, which is a mm. real specimen mm. for a roach. So the, the food yeah. chain is there. We haven't yeah. had a good day today. No. No, it's slowly Well, it's interesting away. because well, it's I think we've seen crayfish, which most yeah. of the, the people on the course won't have seen yeah. previously. So we've got crayfish. the invasive American signal crayfish. And I think the relevance of coming here today is that we have two, two main ponds at Whirlow Brook, which are both in rather poor condition. And what we're seeking to do is to give the group the interest and the skills to monitor and assess some of these invertebrate species. So even if we know we're starting at a low point, as you're saying today here, we're at a bit of a low point, by having information, we will be able to see if future management is working 
and if climate change also in the longer term is also affecting what we're finding in the ponds at Worlow. So today is really about showing people how to do surveys, what to look for, how to use them as indicators and then to give a baseline for future monitoring and future work. So thank you very Sounds much Peter great. for your help and advice. It's been wonderful. So, it, it, so, so, so in 96, 97 you can see they came in to repair some boards, they were the sluice boards at the back here, you know which help to maintain the levels of the water so it doesn't come over the top, so the overspill. So the boards on the overspill needed replacing so they were coming in with a machine and they were doing the desilting. Now after a few years it started to crack which is really good when you talk about sediments cracking up it opens up lets oxygen in there and uh, so so that's, so, the, so that, of the, pond that, that's, that's the sediments that's yeah started to crack that's the whole area right the way up and they took this so load away there been things living in that? Yeah well, I, I'm going to take I'll show you We actually did some work on it monitoring the now, now monitoring the vegetation that came these, in the, yeah the, y Ian came up with Paul Ardron, I think, and there were many other people, botanists, what came up, and they did, there was 88 species recorded, plants, after the four years, you know, when it was dry. So this is 1997. So, 1997. 1997. So we set about, we found, we found that in the edges, we needed to put in a plant called Glyceria maxima, okay, it was a real productive plant, you know, which helped with the invertebrates and everything else. So we found that the depth was too deep. So we had these wooden boxes made and we, 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 we planted those up. So we filled them up with the sediments to create a ledge below so that then you could plant something else on that. So you, you, you're creating different depths. So you can see we're digging it out. The boxes are empty. We're digging it out of the dam and creating a ledge. So it, it served for two purposes. Boxes were filled up. We needed to get it down to about 16 inch in the edge so that these plants, what we wanted to plant to make it more productive, would 16. grow. Okay, so that was that. So then we needed to top them off with gravel or, uh, you know, stones and things like that. So that, that helped it to bind together and kept the plants, you know, the roots of the plants, get them bedded into that. And also the invertebrates, they like stony areas. Yeah, you're thinking about invertebrates as well. For protection so we had 20 ton delivered just there and that was our saturday morning's work so with the wheelbarrows we were going up what kind of material is it that was delivered it, that, that that was just it, it was um it wasn't limestone but it was some kind of a chip uh, sandstone oh, chip wow. that was all so we needed something pretty neutral what wouldn't yeah. affect water quality so you have to be careful about that mm. Yeah. Pebbles, just like pebbles, what builders use, you know, oh, natural, okay. natural yeah. stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, we just, like I said, we were aware of the limestone problem, and yeah, okay. So if you want to <laughs> improve, but mm. it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous way of doing things. So then we planted out. You see, we put it. We're getting rid. Can you see we're planting the boxes up? The Glyceria maxima has already been planted in there. It's called float grass. It is. It's a wonderful, yeah. Float, F-L-O-T-E. It's a wonderful plant in the, you know, when you talk about life cycles of insects and things, they can, you know, go and lay their eggs inside it. You've got the roots, what a lot of the invertebrates like to live round. And then you've got the seed, what falls in there, you know, that's good for fish and what have you. So it's, it, it, it serves a multitude of needs for your, your wildlife. Mm. The glass here reminds me. You just you need. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was very much a situation where the pond was um, an asset, but it wasn't delivering, in biodiversity terms, what you would hope. Yeah. So, you know, it just wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. Hadn't got much emergent vegetation, so that affects the invertebrates. So the whole thing was a was a problem. And that what, that's what you took on, wasn't it? Really, it was I took on to try it, and improve it. it. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there we go, you can see them just come in, where you can see the shelf there, down there. So, there we are. Oh, then we decided we needed an island. <laughs> well, we did put an island in, and that, that was done from the wall side. And uh, another Saturday morning job building that island. I think we've got a picture somewhere. Is that there, so that that's the shape of the island there, can you so see that? It? Sticks up to so above the water surface. Yeah, yes, but we used, we used a, a traditional old methods of getting you know the, the levels right because it was down on the mud so it needed to come up to where the water level or just a little bit above like that mm. so we use what's called boning rods Thank so you. boning rods oh, <laughs> a T yeah it's just a T where we could line up the watermark on the far bank and we had a stick 
where we were going to build the highland so we could get the level of where the water was and then build just a bit above it. So we were using old traditional methods to actually build it and it was wonderful that was because when the water came in we weren't sure <laughs> as being amateurs <laughs> and it just came up perfect. It came up perfect and that then it naturalised after a time but we did plant around that island. As you see, you can see the shape, I don't know if you can see that. So, so again we were removing some of this silt what, were in the, what was in the dam into there to fill that up. But the shape, I went up there and dug, there's four foot of silt there up the bed, yeah, from where that was. I went down and dug a foot in with a shovel. I was on my grindstone at the time and I thought, oh, I'm going to get stuck into that and get started <laughs> because I knew then other lads would be inspired. And once I started putting the shape in, like that, four foot, then, then, then they were there to help you know, do the rest of the work. So it's all about inspiring, isn't it, you know? What was the, the stone? Or the yeah, stone? that was mag limestone what came Magnesium in. Magnesium yeah, so, yeah. We, we felt that that might just help, but I mean, it does for a while, but then it... it I mean, what it does do, it obviously it drops, it removes the acidity to some extent. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So you're putting in a basic material. Yeah. Or less limestone in, in uh, normal carboniferous limestone, maybe some, I don't know. Yeah. It's magnesium uh, carbon, calcium double carbonate. Mm. Mm. So do, I think it, when it when it becomes acidic, a little bit of acid water on that, I think it forms a like a crust and it doesn't oh, it? doesn't yeah. release after a while. Yeah, so yeah. I, think, I think that's it. The silt went in the middle, and then we decided because there was 88 different species of plants <coughs> and still some of them are there, we got what's called Typha latifolia, which is People think they call it bulrush, but it's reed maize, really. Yeah. And it was growing in the middle in areas where when the water came in, we knew it would die off because it was in too deep water. So we moved those to the edges, what we could use. And there were rare plants as well, what were discovered. Ian discovered mm. a few. And there was one, what's a little tiny mimulus, mm. a little mm. tiny mimulus, what had never been recorded down this valley. And we still don't what, know how you know, it got here because it's not yeah. recorded by Sorby Natural History Society no. in this area. It's not in the flora, flora no. No. but it came up in abundance it came up on in the, the, <coughs> the silts. Yeah. yeah, it did. So we couldn't work that out. That's, yeah. That's yeah, one to be so, thought so, about. So, it keeps jogging me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've been trying to think of Mimulus for the last three weeks, and now it's just come back to yeah. me. <laughs> You've jogged my memory. So, yeah, so it's just some pictures of the plants. Why, you get, why did you, you get, need an island? We needed an island. We felt that it might give a, shall we, shall we call it a, 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 a food table for the... Uh, for the uh, birds of prey, <laughs> <laughs> a dinner plate for the birds of prey. But no, no, we thought that would give protection to some of the wildfowl and everything because we put a ramp on there as well, we, a little landing stage with a ramp for the ducks and the swans or whatever to walk up, go on the island, and uh, read. So it was, it was just breeding uh, place. Yeah, a place to and breed. loafing somewhere yeah. just to to hang out at night. Yeah, 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 yeah. Loafing. That's a, that's a term. We had a baseline survey done, just like you probably had around there, so I knew exactly what was in there. But I was frightened to death of not knowing what was there and destroying it. So I had to go out and find out more. Peter, so, do you want so, to just say what we're going to be doing with yeah, the walk round? And yeah, yeah. I'm just conscious that time is... Yeah, the time's going on. So, so we're going to move from here. We've had a little look. We've had an introduction. We're going to have a little walk round, OK? Have a look at some of the different habitats. And, what, and uh, let me just show you a picture of what it was like when, when we finished, by the way, after, after. So that's what it was like, full of vegetation. Can you see the reed beds? It was absolutely wonderful. It's a diverse range of habitats, so you get a diverse range of species, okay? We have an outflow, there's an overspill there. At the moment, you can see what's left of the reed beds. Now that's caused by desiccation, drying up, and we're also Canadian pond, uh, not Canadian pond, Canada geese. <laughs> Canada geese, they like anything what's green, and so they've been taken away, you know, from the uh, reed beds. They've destroyed them a bit, but the dam is low, so most of our vegetation is set back so it's dried out. Now, the last time we did a sample, right, of this area here, we found freshwater shrimp, fairy shrimp, okay, which is a rare species in that it only lives in uh, ponds what dry out and then fill up again. <laughs> so it becomes quite rare. And this is what's been happening here. It's been going down the levels and then coming back up. So we, we, we identified 
fairy shrimp last time we did some monitoring so it'd be nice if we could see them because they are beautiful they're beautiful little things with big black eyes but they're rare they're a red data book species Right, one of the big problems. Oh, wow, you've got there. Oh, wow, we're going to get that. We'll take that and put that under the microscope. Yeah. <laughs> and they, if you go on my blog, I think it is, I can't remember if it's on my blog or my Twitter. Uh, and on the presentation we've done in the resources, I've got a picture taken from here when the water is down, and they were fishing that by bucket nose. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. is the American signal crayfish, and this one I've got has got its claws back because it signals and it has red underneath the claws. And it is it's truly American in character. The British one is a very sort of reserved, small, quiet sort of thing. Uh, the white claw crayfish. Wow. The signal crayfish has got, I don't know, these, these aren't adults. Oh, they're quite tasty. And you can see the no, red. red they are. Oh, yeah. Well, the one I've got is about that big. It's like a lobster. Oh, wow. And it's, it's kind of Clint Eastwood. If you remember the famous thing, come to Clint, make my day. That's the attitude that these have got. They are, I mean, you can see that. It's yeah. quite oh, wow. feisty. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite a decent bite. It, it, it'll fetch <laughs> yeah. 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 We don't want the American ones. Does it eat those? Well, garlic is good. Yeah. For the big ones. They, I mean, they were introduced as a fishery species, yeah. Yeah, they're deliberately introduced. We usually get a bucket full and a solicitor comes down and yeah. he likes to boil them up. Yeah. Yeah, he's hours. You reckon they're better than lobster? And oh, these, these, these were lobster. deliberately introduced. We have native crayfish here and they're still in the brook, yeah. up the Whirlow Brook, yeah. the Lynn Brook. Yeah. But these they're were deliberately introduced yeah. to Nothing. a garden, I think any, up any near the top of the old Bay Brook. Well, and someone has a garden in yeah. a big pond well, what is and they were deliberately the, introduced yeah. in about 2005-2006. Uh, is, is, is the effects of what eat. we've been having Just the water. for something to it's stick on the pond. Down. Oh, no, no, no. no. Yeah. 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 And then yeah. they've bred yeah. and they've come down. Yeah. And they are yeah. here now in the yeah. 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 They are obviously a feisty predator. They also burrow. So they can mm -hmm. undermine engineering yeah. structures. They burrow into banks, so they really? cause oh, right. quite major Seriously. erosion of bank systems and stuff. And of course, the native one we're very keen to try and keep mm -hmm. is nationally a threatened species. Yeah, really. So, uh, big problem. We've also, I noticed, we've got swimming about. Yeah, yeah. no, actually, yeah. Mice now, mice if you compare this little sample, yeah. which I just fished out with yeah, not yeah, much effort. Yeah. No. Um, there's your old gear, look. Compared to what we're finding in the ponds at Whirlow, mm -hmm. look at all these little things scooting around. Little tiny organisms there. There's loads and loads of stuff. Yeah. And different species, and I'm not sure what that is unless yeah, yeah. we get under the yeah, microscope. Under microscope. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need to check things like that back and have a look, see what they are under the microscope. So some of these are what we call microarthropods. These are the little yeah. um, tiny animals. And it's these that the fish eat, and some of these things eat the freshwater algae, which will also be in here. So you get uh, single-celled algae and stuff in the water. Again, that's one for specialists. It appears we, we had trouble with the lilies here as well, Ian. Yeah. We had trouble with which the native lily, yeah. the white yeah. alba one, and we could <laughs> never grow them. No. And yet when you go over to Wyamill, it just yeah. flourishes yeah. over there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But we've had trouble with that one. Mm. It's weird. Mm. Yeah, but the oxygenators... Canadian pondweed, that when I first took this, it was a major problem because people brought the frogs and things and emptied them into the dam and come with the, with the, with the, with the Canadian, and, and, and it was just a mass of that. So we know that it can survive, but I don't know whether... I mean, one problem you know, that you do have, um, less at Whirlow than here, <coughs> is that you're going to get bird populations and the birds will... Well, the birds do two things. They eat the vegetation. Yeah. So a lot of them will eat your pondweed and your peripheral and vegetation, nutrients. which isn't a problem if you've not got too many birds and you've got plenty of vegetation. If you're trying to establish it, that 
eating vegetation by the birds can oh, be a problem. Yeah, definitely, yeah, so the yeah, birds yeah, eat yeah, the yeah, plants, yeah. but the other thing which makes things much worse is the birds poop in the water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And That's you've all seen plants. where you've got things like Canada geese or grey lag geese around a lake. Yeah, yeah. You get very short clipped grass because the, the birds eat the grass and you get lots of goose poop, yeah. which is high, high levels of nutrients, very accessible to the water. So that is really bad news. Yeah. Yeah, we do. I, I think going back to the eutrophication and the uh, oligotrophic, I, I, I tried to classify this as being mesotrophic somewhere in the middle. Mm. I did, and because of its altitude's got a lot to do with it. You go around, you get lower down, Doncaster area, then the mm. nutrients seem to be higher, you know, down there, because wow. it's lower down, isn't it? Mm. The, but I, I, I personally classified this one, you know, as probably being mesotrophic, somewhere in the middle. Because we've never seen the blue-green algae or anything like that, although we know that it can be quite rich in nutrients, we've never seen that blue-green, you know, and the explosions of algae.